Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Now, all of these podcast interviews are an absolute privilege. I get to talk to some phenomenal human beings and brilliant minds, and I pretty much can't think of anything better. But some have extra resonance, and their conversations I'm so grateful I get to have, and this is definitely one of those. I've known keyboard player, programmer, producer, and jazz pianist Mark DeClive Lowe for a while now. I recorded his first quartet album in 1996. We ran an independent jazz label together in Auckland back in the late 90s. We co-produced a handful of records, a couple of compilations. We drank a medically inadvisable number of espressos and flat white coffees all over Auckland's burgeoning cafe scene, stayed up way past anyone's reasonable bedtime in bars and clubs, listened to countless records, recorded literally hundreds of performances by New Zealand jazz artists for a syndicated radio series called Kiwi Jazz Tracks. We shared an inner city loft apartment where our kitchen doubled as a rehearsal space and the living room was kind of a free hostel for touring jazz musicians, complete with old school football table. And I think it's entirely possible we had the first online record label in the Southern Hemisphere, though, of course, that mostly involved putting CDs in envelopes and posting them to people. And, well, that was all several lifetimes ago, but, of course, a huge part of who I am now. Since then, Mark went on to become an absolute pioneer of the UK broken beat scene, which brought jazz progressions and heavily syncopated beats to the dance floor, as well as to my record collection, an early 2000s radio show. And now based in LA, he's incredibly prolific, musically diverse, and until very recently, constantly mobile. Whether showcasing new tech for the likes of Native Instruments in Germany, packing out sweaty 3am dance clubs in Istanbul with live electronic dance music, performing acoustic jazz sets in Japan, or MDing his regular LA church sessions with an astonishing range of world-class musicians and DJs, marks pretty much what happens when you mix phenomenal musicianship with technological virtuosity, and then put that all to work in the service of making things better for humanity. From his LA studio, my brother, Mark to Clive Lowe. Enjoy. Mark to Clive Lowe, thanks for joining us for the MTF podcast today. Thank you for having me, man. You're very welcome. Um, we have probably, it's fair to say, a little bit of history. We have a few years of history, yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that connection is before we go into what you've gone on to do and achieve since then? For sure. Um, you know, I grew up in Auckland in New Zealand and... In my early 20s, all I wanted to do was be like an acoustic straight ahead jazz piano player. Like the fantasy was go live in New York or, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, I was playing in Auckland around then with a drummer, Tony Hopkins, great jazz drummer. And he, you and he were doing a radio show together, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Was what was that called? Uh, off the Record, the Kiwi Jazz Show. Off yeah. the Record, yeah. So we met through that, right? Tony bringing me into that. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting because I was at a point where, as an aspiring jazz musician with a band, I wanted to record and I wanted to you know, do that kind of thing and not knowing much about it. And you know, I think, and so we connected through that, right? With the mm. Yeah, you'd just come back from Berkeley, right? Yeah, I did, I, did one, I did one year there, one semester in class and one semester dropped out but on campus um okay and that was cool but then i came back to new zealand i actually wanted to move to sydney within three months is what i was saying um uh-huh. and it was like i think three years until i left and that was to the rest of the world and not sydney <laughs> right but um that was definitely where my headspace was it was all about the jazz thing and and you know pretty conservative as well like you know coming up very much kind of pulling from the 60s kind of miles thing and i loved what winter marsales was doing with a kind of a, his neo neoclassical renaissance and around that time but it was funny because i you know i grew up on like hip-hop and new jack swing and there was a time in high school when i had a you know, drum machine and a keyboard and a sequencer and i didn't know what i was doing but i was just making stuff right right and and kind of dabbling in a bit of production collaborating with like vocalists and rappers and djs in auckland but I made a, a full 180 from that. Um, one day I woke up and I was just like, oh, man, all these loops and stuff. It's just bullshit. I'm going to sell my equipment. I'm going to sell my vinyl. It's just going to be the piano, me, 
some miles records and some Coltrane records. And that was it. And, and I was just kind of blindly trying to learn, decipher how to play, how to interface with this whole other form, this music. Mm-hmm. Just out of curiosity, where did the jazz thing come from for you? Because, you know, it's not, it's not clear or obvious where that might have originated from. Right. So my dad, his 20s were in the 50s. And mm-hmm. he really loved jazz, like specifically big band music and like, you know, Count Basie, Duke Ellington. Um, his tastes were fairly conservative, but there was definitely, you know, he, he loved it as a, as a sound. And so I heard it from his records. And then my oldest brother, Ian, he was a really talented musician. I thought he was the most talented of the family, he played piano. And he's eight years older than me. So I guess I had this, attraction to i want to do what he's doing so right right uh, he got into playing with um actually grant chilcott well went with brewster back in the day um yeah yeah. and so real lounge stuff yeah like loungy kind of cole porter gershwin um and then ian took me one night to you might remember what it's called there was a jazz club in the sheraton hotel oh wow which i don't remember what it was called but no me neither ian was like i'm gonna go and see this guy james morrison and you know, I'm going to take you. And I remember two things happened that night. One was was the first time hearing a jazz quartet that played with full energy in really close proximity. And then secondly was I met a girl there who was, I think she was a year or two older than me, but our brothers knew each other. Mm-hmm. And she was just such a head for the music. And so we were just like, you know, bugging out the music together. Sure. Which was, I hadn't had the experience before. You know, I'd be like listening to Miles records or something, but there was no, I, that was my first time experiencing that kind of shared sense of community through the, through the consumption of, you know, some live improvised music. Right, being in the room with it. Being right there, yeah. yeah. And I think that left a big impression on me. Um, but the, you know, I, through my high school years, I needed to rebel against what I was raised on and, you know, I played the piano because my dad forced me to. I had no choice. Um, you know, he liked jazz, mm-hmm. but you know, he didn't. He didn't like Public Enemy, and he didn't like you know, X Clan, and and um, you know, even if I'm playing you know some some New Jack Swing like some guy, that would be too much for him. Uh-huh. But uh, so so you know, that became my my getaway, and and I, I think also in hindsight, like it was tied to growing up biracially in a country which had no concept of how to support that. And so th- I think there was a sense of cultural otherness that for me was, it was helped by getting into a music that was a minority music. Right. Talk a little bit about that because your, your mum's Japanese, right? Yeah. My dad's like European New Zealander. You know, I was born in 74. So growing up through the 80s in New Zealand, you know, there's already this really kind of culturally binary Pakeha Maori thing, which, you know, as you know, had a lot of, a lot of unresolved issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my dad moves back from Japan in 1973 with his Japanese wife and a couple of kids, me on the way. He was a very successful self-made man at that point. So he landed and bought a beautiful house. And yeah, you know, I think it was a bit of a statement. It's like, I'm here. Sure. So I grew up in this way where home was kind of the Japan. Like he'd lived in Japan for 20 years and pretty much, you know, turned Japanese. So home was Japan. And then the outside world especially the work, the schools I went to, they were pretty much, you know, European, New Zealand majorities. And there'd be like, you know, one kid from Sri Lanka, one kid from China. That's it. And it's interesting because those kids had, you know, 100% of a cultural identity of a, like a, to, to, to anchor them. This, this idea of being from somewhere, I guess. Totally. And that's for them, at least, it's, even if there weren't other Sri Lankan kids at school, yeah. that would have been reflected in their home by everyone. And then in their, prob- I imagine, in their community, like, you know, that's especially at that point in time, if there's some Sri Lankans in Auckland, they're going to be living in, in a community, <laughs> you know, they're going to help each other out. Sure. Being biracial was a di- whole different thing. And I never looked I'm fully Japanese, but there was an age when, you know, kids kind of start to clock oh, his dad drives, you know, a BMW, and but his mum drives a beat up Toyota or, you know, they, they start to clock stuff. Uh-huh. And so they clocked that my mum was Japanese. And there was, you know, definitely, you know, I, I had to deal with racial bullying and st- racist bullying and stuff. And that was weird because it's like, well, but 
I'm not Japanese, but my mum's Japanese, but I'm part. It was, you know, as a kid, it's like, it's, and then there's no, there was no parental infrastructure to help support the idea of cultural identity. You know, they're from a generation which didn't even talk about right. anything, yeah, yeah. you know, in, in, in the family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, 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 how are you feeling at all? So, <laughs> sure, sure. So, yeah, it was really interesting and kind of not, just no, never feeling really in place. And then in 1990, Andy Van, DJ from Auckland, and this guy Chris Bader formed this collective called the Voodoo Rhyme Syndicate. And that was a collective of mostly South Auckland, Pacific Island kids who were making R&B, hip-hop, and New Jack Swing, and stuff like that. And so I met one crew of them, this band Semi-MCs, and they invited me in, and I, I'd go and hang at their house. You know, it's all, they're all Samoan kids, and you know, Ned Roy, he was DJing. They're all making beats, listening to records, talking about music, making music, dancing, singing. I'd never seen anything like this. Mm. And it was compared to the social culture I'd been raised in, especially through my parents, this was so much, so, so loose and warm and welcoming and, and non judgmental. Um, it was really interesting. So mm. that led me into like a couple of years of just being deep in that community and, you know, collaborating a lot kind of trying to produce records when I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I remember that feeling. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, was, that was definitely, you know, the first time I felt the feeling of tribe. Right. Wow. Yeah. And then you kind of turned your back on it. Yeah, it was weird. I mean, I think it was because I didn't know. Well, no, I think in hindsight that my, my spirit wanted my spirit needed, had a lot more to learn. Right. I knew it wanted to learn other things. And, you know, it's all come full circle, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we'll get, we'll get to. Um, but that clearly everything has been a necessary part of the story and has created the sum total of now. Shift away from um, sort of produced music and beats and uh, samples and so on to like an acoustic-based jazz. Was there anything about the technology? Was it about, well, that's not authentic and this is? Or was it about just the sound of the music? Huh. I think it was partly the piano as an instrument because when I was kind of messing around with keyboards and drum machines, that's a very different thing. Like, yeah, you know, analog synthesis is, is kind of, I think, the, 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 the middle ground. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you know, an acoustic instrument, the way a person connects with that and communicates and resonates and the way that reverberation and vibration connects with people is different to electronic. Sure. Not saying either one doesn't, but, you know, they're just different. And so I think there was something in me. You know, I played piano from age four. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a drawing back to the piano, like just on a subconscious level. And then, I mean, I was literally making loops from a fairly theoretically uninformed kind of non-foundation of a foundation. And it was fun, but I didn't see how it could evolve at that point, I guess. And then I'd hear, well, I mean, what blew me away was Mo Better Blues. I went to see Mo Better Blues and um, when it came out, Spike Lee film and the, you know, the film aside and the narrative aside, the music was just like a lightning bolt for me. I just, I didn't know what, I didn't know, I didn't know that existed. Right, like, right. I went the next day, went to Marbex, to the record store, got the soundtrack and it was Terrence Blanchard and the Bramford Marsalis Quartet or the Brantford Marsalis Quartet and Terence Blanchard. Uh, Terence went on to do all Spike Lee's soundtracks. But so, and then Bramford had a record out that that time too called Crazy Crazy People Music. So I bought that too. And yeah, between that and like a 1960, what was it about 1964 Miles Carnegie Hall concert or something, and actually an Errol Garner record concert by the sea. Mm -hmm. Like all these things, I was I was just hearing this rawness of creativity. And obviously, even without knowing, the cumulative sound of a group of people creating together and you know communicating in that with improvised music, it doesn't strike me as strange that I would wake up one day at age you know seventeen or sixteen and be like, "Oh, those loops are bullshit." Hmm. Like, let me get let me get with this. Yeah, I mean, for, the other thing that really strikes me, and I kind of feel like I can say this about you, is that you seem to be somebody who really likes to be able to be really, really good at something. And that maybe the piano was something that you thought, that's the thing that I can be really, really good at, you know, better than most people. Huh. Um, I don't know. I mean, 
I feel like the, the as much as the piano is what is, is the instrument I feel most connected to, I I feel like I'm I've, I've been fighting it my whole life. Wow. Um, you know, it wasn't until it wasn't until I, I went to the UK for and lived in London for ten years, and I was you know, found myself back in electronic music and more specifically club music. I didn't play acoustic piano for ten years, and mm. that was such a relief. It's like I I didn't have to. I think before that, especially the headspace I was in, and it's around, it's around the time that you and I met and we were, were working together, you know, there was very much that kind of jazzer mentality of it's got to be the best and who's better than who and how fast are you playing or how just, just these kind of really ego-driven kind of ideas about music, which is not what jazz music is about, but, no. but that's, that was, for whatever reason, what I was developing in. Uh-huh. And so the, to go to the UK and... Be involved in this in club music that I was, I was really inspired by, and I could apply what I'd learnt with the piano without playing piano. And it wasn't mm. it wasn't about you know who played the dopest solo on that tune or or whatever. It felt like a whole different idea, and I didn't. Let's before before you get to the UK, yeah, because actually there's, there's a really interesting thread there that I want to pick up. But before you get there, you actually made that shift from I want to make these uh, acoustic jazz albums, and, and like we we made some albums together, and you like yeah. absolutely love those records. Uh, there are things that I don't like about them that I wish I could change about them that I take responsibility for, but that's another story. Oh, no, that's all <laughs> but, good. First thoughts has a vibe. That that record has a vibe. First thoughts really yeah. has a vibe. First, yeah. Th- yeah, and and vision we should have chosen another studio. Uh-huh. Um, but that's another story. Yeah. But but you after that you actually went. No, I'm going to go over here into hip hop for a bit. Uh, I'm going to go in here and, and work in something that has got a got a beat to it, and it's more electronic, and it's more that that seemed to be almost a light switch from where I was sitting. Yeah, I mean there were multiple factors. One was called celeb. Sure. So, you know, we had this club in Auckland, The Box, which was play- which was always like peak time DJ vibe. And then the chill out room called Celeb, we have kind of, I guess, as the jazz kind of groups. It was coming out of that sound. Sure. Um, you know, Nathan Haynes really established that room in that way. And for me, we'd go in one- once a month, I'd be in there and it'd be like a jam band. Like there'd be two drummers, two bass players, horn players, rappers, someone scratching I'd be, I'd be playing keys and it'd all be improvised and it was so fun it was so much fun and also that energy of like you're playing at three in the morning on saturday night and you've got people popping pills in the club next door and then when they want to chill out for a bit they come out to this, this club <laughs> and it was a very cool kind of intersection of culture sure uh, and i remember playing at the town hall in auckland with kim kim patterson uh-huh. and i remember mid gig Think while well, I'm playing on the grand piano, and I was thinking, you know, well, I'm, I'm so serious about the serious shit. What would happen if I was a little more serious about the fun stuff? And so that was like a light switch moment. And it was the other thing which helped kind of prime it was jungle. When Herzog was at its peak, you know, we had this this bar club in the city, Herzog, where behind the bar was just full of statues. Of, right you know, the Mother Mary and Christ. <laughs> it, was, it was really, it was pretty weird. But they, they were playing really edgy jungle and, you know, what became drum and bass. And for me, hearing that music, hearing club music that was electronic yet kind of organic and had a lot of surprise in it and a lot of space, like in the space I could hear, it made me think of what could be done with it. And from my perspective, that was really inspiring. So mm. it was like kind of those three things happening at once. And then also I think maybe subconsciously part of it would have been, you know, that's that search to find your own voice. Mm. You know, I feel like for me personally, and I'm not saying this about every person who plays acoustic jazz, but for me in that world, I didn't I didn't understand how I could find my voice. Like, you know, my aspiration was people who have already existed. Right. And it's like you know, you could play Herbie Hancock note for note, but you'll never be Herbie Hancock. And if you really nail it, then that voice is not even your voice. Yeah. And so I don't think I, I understood it on those terms at that point, but I think on a more subconscious level, there was an awareness that there's other stuff to explore, mm. more food to eat. Yeah. 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 And then your next record was on an electronic music label. It had rappers on it. It had a DJ, like manual scratching on it. And yeah. 
Yeah, six degrees. I mean, that was a that was a turnaround. Um, but that, I mean, that record was a was it literally um, like a, a diary or a, a journal of the preceding year. I'd spent twelve months on a grant that I'm super grateful to this day to get. But it basically paid for me to go around the world for a year and just go and explore music wherever I wanted to go. Mm. So that so that was it. Ended up being San Fran. Havana, New York, London, Paris, Tokyo, and Sydney. I think that was it pretty much over over one year. Um, and it was it was absolutely life changing. I mean, being in Havana in 1998, and it was, I mean, I'd love to go there now, but I know that it was mm. it was even more so then. Just kind of feeling, I'd never been somewhere where there was a feeling of like the the kind of the cult, a cultural feeling of the blood of the land. Like this is this is their land and this is their culture and this is just so deeply ancestrally rooted here, mm-hmm. and it was the first place I'd been which has like African diaspora roots, which is a whole other thing. And so I'm going to like a Wednesday afternoon rumba party in the in the in a park or something, and it's just all these percussionists and a woman singing. It's very Santa Rea kind of vibe, and you know about 400 people just dancing and drinking all day, like. It was that was incredible. So I mean, th- th- there were so many things that happened on that trip, and that actually wasn't the most pivotal thing. But they all were part of this amazing experience of a year, and going to London and meeting and collaborating with amazing people there. You know, Phil Asher, IG Culture, Four Hero, Bugs in the Attic. It was a whole crew, and then you know, taking all those experiences, primary of which actually was seeing these guys, especially in the UK and London seeing them chop up drums and samples on a drum machine on the MPC or an SP and, you know, re- reprogramming it and reshaping and reconfiguring that to create something that was just totally new and and didn't even have a reference in the... In, it wasn't the music I'd been listening to. It was, it was new music. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, very much influenced by some very key things from the past and in the whole black music lineage. But it was a it was a fresh interpretation, which ironically came about from a community of people who were all individuals who f- who got bored in their own scenes. Like you had someone who, like Phil Asher, you have a house producer in a community where they're like, well, if the house if the if the kick's not on every beat of the measure, then it's not house music. And so he starts moving the kick around a little bit, and they're like, it's not house music. And so this was happening with all these people who became kind of misfits in their own communities. To a, in in their creative aspiration, mm. so and therefore coming all together, having that in common, even though they're coming from different, you know, someone's coming from jungle drum and bass, someone's coming from house, someone's coming from reggae and roots, and all these different things, and that was a really inspiring meeting to to meet these people and then realize what I could contribute to what they were doing, and we could create together. You're talking about broken beat specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What became broken beat? Totally. Yeah. Because you became sort of, you know, one of the central figures in that whole kind of movement. Would, would that be fair to say? Um, I collaborated on hundreds of records. And there were, you know, I guess, Kaidi Tatham, amazing keyboard player and producer. He, he to me, keyboard-wise and musically would be like a definitely one of the architects of that sound. Um, and he... Most of the records were either were him and otherwise they were me. Right. So there was definitely a, a large input, and it was a really interesting thing to be a part of a community that is it's so underground. Like it wasn't making noise in the same way that you know trap music is, is global, no. but we would hear about the ripple effects. You know, we're, we're all listening to like you know. James Poyser and like his 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 work on with Quest Love and stuff, and then we hear we hear that James is listening to our music. It's like, well, that's amazing. That's like you know, we're just aspiring to that, and so to have it kind of spreading and and doing its thing was was pretty amazing. I think that it it was interesting because it spoke to a lot of different kinds of people as far as the subgenres of of sample based electronic music. Like you know, hip hop heads loved it, house heads loved it. It became this kind of very tribal kind of unity sound um and for and it had clearly been made by people who'd heard jazz yeah 
Yeah, I mean, if you know, if they if it wasn't like played music, then if it was sample based music, you know, they're chopping up some weather report or some shit. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting for me coming through ostensibly as you know my biggest aspiration had been as a jazz musician, but this music wasn't about you know shredding solos all over the the drums. It was it was all about functionality of sound. You know, it was it was all designed to be forward thinking dance floor music. So in that context, everything's got to have a function in the rhythm. And so the fun of it, the fun challenge of it as a musician was how do we you know, subversively feed as much music into this as possible that the people may not even realize they're getting. Right. Or they're, they're, they're getting off on the most twisted like chord progression, but it's, it's got a sonic functionality, which is what they're responding to. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sidebar, are you a dancer? <laughs> There was a time when with Voodoo Rhyme Syndicate, I loved to dance then, yeah. And then I find myself once in a blue moon, specifically in Japan, actually, the DJ will play something which just be like, oh, that's why I had a little move around. Um, yeah. But the answer is no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so you make the dance music for the people who do the dancing. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like we're getting away from the chronology a little bit, but uh, which is which is absolutely cool. I mean, this is not, Sorry, yeah. you know, this is your life or, or or anything like that. But I'm really interested in in the tech side of things and what yeah. what you were drawn to and and yeah. you know, what you kind of felt like was a good representation of your voice through technology, I guess. Yeah, so that I mean that has kept evolving and which is really cool. And I would have to include the piano as a piece of OG tech, absolutely. For sure. But like, you know, the whole, that whole time in London, especially that the first time I went in 98, on my way back to New Zealand, I was in Japan and I went to this music store, 5G in Harajuku, which is, it's incredible. They have like five or six of everything. Yeah. And when I say everything, it's like, you know, six Profit Five, six Mini Moves, you know, <laughs> and then a CS80 lying on the ground. And it's crazy, like the analog synth stuff. But I'm in the shop and they had a wall of NPCs. You know, Roger Linux, I drum machine samplers, and I'm looking at this wall. I'm like, do I do I really need an MPC? And I kept leaving the shop and coming back and leaving, coming back. And I eventually bought one. I was like, well, this is you know, it's the the people I've been working with. This is what I've seen them creating with. For the gearheads, which one did you have? Well, the, my first one then was the MPC 2000. Ah, uh-huh. okay. And I've seen guys working on the 60 and the 3000 mostly in London. But yes, yeah, so I got this the, the 2000. Went back to New Zealand. And I just started making music using the MP, a Roland JP8080 um, synth module. And I had a Rhodes as well at the apartment, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was basically it. So I pre-produced all the music for that record, primarily on the MPC. Went in studio, recorded a whole lot of musicians. And then I did the unthinkable for a studio purist. So we, we went into Helen Young, you know, the... Mm-hmm. the abbey road studios of new zealand yeah and um r.i.p yep andre was engineering recorded all the musicians i wanted like a drummer playing additional hats and stuff upright bass flute i recorded some roads there percussion recorded all the tape and then andre dumped it to to dat tape for me right so i had everything on dat it's like cool and i was like okay now what i do because i want to make this stuff in the mpc and i didn't have a i didn't have a dat player and actually, was it DAT or ADAT? It was probably ADAT. If it was multi-track, it was probably ADAT, which was like digital multi-track on SVHS tapes. Right. So it was it was ADAT. So I didn't have an ADAT player. Right. And who would? And I I feel like I feel like you had. One. I had access to one. I had one. I was working in Progressive Studios in Anzac Ave at the time in Auckland. And right. So I th- I think you helped me find one. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so I have that now. I have the ADAT and. What I would do now in that situation is I would sample the ADAT directly into the MPC. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd probably dump it onto the computer first, actually, but that wasn't even an option back then, right? Exactly, yeah. So, you know, I through my whole travels, one of my mainstay pieces of kit with me traveling around was my mini-disc recorder. You know, I'd do a studio session in London, and I'd just grab a quick desk mix onto the mini-disc, and I'd have a bounce of it. You know, that yeah. was kind of crazy technology in 1998. For sure. And, you know, I didn't understand anything about audio compression this is like 1998 (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) and so you know i took these adats and i dubbed them all off onto mini disc and then i sampled the mini discs into the mpc wow okay because i had to to return the adat yeah and 
Yeah, you know, I don't know the bit rate, but I think in yeah. terms we talk about now, it's like taking a like a web file, making a shitty MP3 of it, and then sampling off the shitty MP3 instead of off the web file. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I made the record like that. And I told Andre, the engineer, he was furious, but he's like, but it sounds good though. <laughs> <laughs> You've added some crunch. Yeah. Right? Bit of, bit, bit of, bit yeah. of digital crunch. Um, yeah. But from- and then the MP became really the heart of what I was doing. When I did that album live, you know, the MPC was part, was the, that was the sound of the band. You know, I'd have a live drummer, live bass player, but the sound of the band was the MPC, just bringing that sonic weight um, and kind of sample vibe. I upgraded to the MPC 3000 not long after that, which just sounds so much better. You know, just the, it's still the dream machine, isn't it? It is, man. I mean, I actually had a show in New Orleans maybe maybe four or five years ago, and I, mean, I hadn't touched the MPC in, like, at that point in maybe seven years. And right before I went to New Orleans, my computer died. And you know, my setup is Ableton-based, right. using machine, so without the computer, I'm fucked. And I didn't have time to get a new computer or anything like that. I'm like, I'm going to have to pull out the MP. And so it hadn't come out of its flight case in like seven years. So I take it out. Did you have a zip drive? I had a SCSI zip drive in there. I'm like, I hope wow. this shit works. Yeah, for sure. And I found some zip disks. And there's one that was like, it said like, you know, 20, you know, 2009 live kits. Uh-huh. So it was one, one of my London, it would be earlier than that, it'd be like maybe 2007 live kits. So it's like one of my London kits. I was like, all right, let me try and load this up. Zip disk sounded like like an old car trying to start, but it, it loaded up and and it just, it totally blew my mind. The sound of that beast was incredible. Yeah. And these are drum kits where, like when I moved to a digital system, like a computer-based system, I was using the same MPC drum kits. Like I know those sounds. I've made records with them for years. And so to hear them after seven years of not hearing them out the MPC, to hear them straight out the MP, yeah. in, in my studio room where I'm, I know the sound, I was fucking terrifyingly amazing. It was, mm. it was great. But then I did the show. It was fun, but it, it, it kind of slowed my workflow right down. Sure. Because there's so much more. You can do so much faster now. But it was cool. But yeah, that, that to say the MP really became the heart of everything I did for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Did that, because uh, people talk about the the 3000 having the Lynn swing. Yeah. Uh, that it was different to the other ones in some way. Did that, I mean, the fact that you were using that machine, did that have an impact on what you ended up sounding like as a result? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that that's, you know, the idea is that when the sounds were on the quantized grid and that Roger Lynn had designed these rhythm gro- groove templates which were slightly off that by you know by his choice of amount of feel and yeah it, it, when you use employ that function it's it's a whole sound mm-hmm. but i mean primarily this the mp for me especially the 3000 is just about the sonic quality of it like right you know i, I love that kind of that hip-hop aesthetic of big kicks and big snares and they just you know they'll like just you know right hooks it was, it was crazy mm. so that was inspiring but um but workflow wise i mean you know as things have evolved you know i'd, I'd be on tour with the mpc 3000 and you know land land in some country at some airport and the flight case would come out first thing i do is open it and hope that it's still in one piece you know, I've, yeah. I've blown up maybe five of them on tour around the world you know i had a, we did a warehouse party in sydney um actually camp it was cameron undy's warehouse at the time but, you know, super hot, sweaty warehouse party, peak time, dance floor vibe. And I'm banging out beats over the MPC. And it's got a little ventilator kind of op- ventilator opening, opening, op- opening spits on the top. And so I'm banging out beats and I sw- my sweat went off my forehead straight into the ventilator shaft of the MPC. So, you know, instant nothing. Yeah. Silence. You know, it's that kind of thing is... I got to a point where I understood it's not, it's not practical. Um, sure. So then, Native Instruments Machine was became my go-to, and that was a comp- then for then I was using a combination of machine running standalone on the computer, and I'd have Serato running on a turntable with acapellas because I for some reason even though it was a digital file I wanted the the optics of the turntable, uh-huh. and so I'd be building stuff on machine and then you know bringing in the acapella off the turntable. But that was very limited too, because the turntable, you have a limit of of how much you can change the key or the speed. 
if, if I got excited and jumped up and down, then the, you know, the, the needle jumps. <laughs> if someone knocks it, I'm fucked and so much stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, then I switch. It's interesting though, because from that tech perspective, you ended up becoming somebody who demonstrates these tech products by, you know, look what this thing can do. Yeah. So the, the kind of the, the pushing at the boundaries of what's possible with the technology, I guess, became part of your thing. Yeah, I think it's more a matter, yes, I think it's also a matter of that my specific use case was different from what the manufacturer had thought about. You know, I have a great ongoing relationship with Native Instruments and I actually, they, they sent me the first machiner and it sat there for a year. Like I plugged it in one time because it kind of looks like an NPC, yeah. but it wouldn't just, if I, I tried to use it like an NPC and it wouldn't do anything. It's like, oh, fuck this. And I just left on, you know, let it gather dust for a year uh, until I had someone actually show me through it. He was an ex NPC user, so he spoke the translation I needed to hear. Mm-hmm. But once I started using it, I was all about it. And as it's evolved through its iterations and OS updates and stuff, there'd be things that I want to do. And I'd talk to native instruments about it. And they'd be like, yeah, we, we didn't think of that. Or that didn't seem, I didn't, yeah, that didn't seem important. I'm like that's like vital to my workflow. Mm-hmm. So I understand that clearly that's not the majority workflow, but especially with, I think, software-based hardware um, systems, hybrid systems, they're really trying to keep them evolving and cover all the bases. Sure. Yeah. And I guess that plays into things like accessibility as well. If something's that uh, adaptable, Mm -hmm. then uh, you get to be able to sort of design it in that way. Totally. I mean, I've, I've worked on a product where, you know, my first complaint about it, I'm not naming the company, (laughs) <laughs> um, but my first complaint was like, you know, if it can't do this, then how am I supposed to use it live? And they, they were saying, well, we didn't design it for live use. It's for the studio. It's like, how are you going to stop me taking it live? Like, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> sure. So it's interesting, when, I think, when some, some of the companies don't necessarily consider that. And hopefully they're all always considering that. But mm-hmm. there's no such thing as like, you know, it's like even if you have an indoor light someone's going to use it outdoor like it's going to happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure i mean on that which is which is kind of interesting even though you've made more records and and we'll probably talk about some of them but you're a live performer first and foremost you are somebody who's on the road you know all the time you know, first talk a little bit about that but also what's it like not being able to do that mm. so i started touring in new zealand in 1996 and I started doing shows in Japan around the same time. Yeah. But from 2000, I had the record we were talking about earlier, Six Degrees. It was signed in the UK. So I moved to the UK kind of properly. And from 2000, I've been touring literally nonstop. Like I, I, I don't think there's been a single time in 20 years I've been at home for more than a month. And wow, that's been amazing. Like it's been such an amazing adventure and especially over that amount of time, like 20 years to see, to see music evolve and you know, culture evolve and places evolve and travel and politics and all sorts of stuff, but from the perspective of being in many different places and you know, probably ne- never getting a really deep feel for anywhere unless I go there regularly, like Japan, mm-hmm. but still getting an interesting perspective on the planet, on music, on culture, on humanity. That was cool. And and it was just so exciting. Like, I love the feeling of taking off from wherever I live. So taking off from LA and it's like as the plane gets up to cruising alt- altitude, it's like my idea, my idea battery is just going supercharged <laughs> and all these amazing things happen. And I'm, I usually have like notes, squeeds of notes from flying in between places of ideas. So there's a lot of freedoms I associated with it. And I think on a personal level too, you know, when I had, when my son was born, I wasn't ready for fatherhood in that way. And so touring was a way to, to escape that as well. That, that became life. And I'd say over the last couple of years, you know, it, it never slowed down. The last couple of years have probably been two of my busiest years ever. But I also had this feeling of like, you know, wouldn't it be great to, to tour less, to tour, to tour something more special, get paid more money and do it less? You mean make it sustainable? Wow, that's such an avant-garde concept, man. Sustainability, <laughs> let me say it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was, I did a tour in Japan like maybe two years ago. I did, I did nine shows in seven days in seven cities. Wow. 
and I was going by train in between the cities. So I've got my suitcase, I've got a pelican full of gear, like I've got a mono backpack full of gear, I've got my own little backpack. I'm getting on and off these trains, not sleeping a whole lot. My body's getting tired, and it's it's just it's a lot. And and there's there's a there's an undeniable joy in playing anywhere and sharing my perspective of music and having people receive that and having people connect with it. You know, one of the gigs during that tour, it was this tiny little bar in Betbu, which is a a natural hot spring destination. And it was the weirdest, coolest people. It was so fun. And on black and white, on paper, on financially, probably it's not like an aspirational gig. Personally, it was amazing. Sure. So, you know, that exchange that happens with people, that's what has really fueled me. And then, of course, the just as a business model, you know, I, I wasn't looking at it from a sustainability practice, but I was looking at like, okay, this works, but I have to keep doing it. Right. So it's a hamster wheel, which never ends. And then it's addictive as well. You know, it's like this kind of almost a bragging rights. Like, you know, I've, I've flown around the world, you know, enough times to go to the moon and back 18 times or you know, whatever you get to say, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so when, when, this, when the pandemic happened, it was interesting. I was, you know, I, I had a full calendar up until actually around now. Uh-huh. Like I, I knew exactly what I was doing. And I was, I was with a couple of friends who were driving up to San Francisco to play at SF Jazz. And my friend Haley's band, and so we were we've been driving for like four, four or five hours. We we're two hours out of San Fran, listening to Gavin Newsom's address, the governor of California, and his address was shutting down all gatherings over fifty people. And so we pulled over the side of the road, and Haley checked the phone, and sure enough, there was an email canceling tonight's gig. I had a gig the next night in Oakland, just across the water from San Fran, that got canceled immediately, and we just sat by the side of the road smoke weed and watch all these emails come in just cancellations and that i mean we pretty much spent the weekend kind of like i think in kind of shock slash chilling out just like you know the news was on staying state we stayed in the, in, the, in the same area and just didn't know what to do it was obviously very fast that everything got cancelled and it, it happened a lot more as you know it happened a lot more before almost any other industry like musicians the music industry went, I, I, I don't know if it went first, but it felt like we went first. Yeah, it certainly went fast. Very fucking fast, right? And so, you know, I, I had a Asia tour, uh, I had a South Africa thing, I had a Europe thing. There were shows in the States. I mean, it's all sorts of shit. It's all gone. And so for me, the interesting, what I thought was interesting was that I looked at it like touring has gone and it's not coming back. Right. Ever. And I don't know if I believe that, but I behaved like that. And I think that was good. So, you know, once I had a clear head, I was, you know, got out my notebook, you know, listed down every potential revenue stream I feel like I could, I could, I could get, whether I wanted to or not, just like we're still within the greater kind of parameters of, of music. Right. Just so I could at least have a visual. And I kind of fleshed them out a little bit. And I had essentially an action plan. I didn't know it was an action plan, but essentially an action plan. And I was, I, I remember thinking like, you know, I'd say to friends what I was doing. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm acting as if, well, I, I'd say, I, I would say Turing can clean back and they'd be in shock. And I'd always say, well, if it comes back, when, if, however it comes back, if I can improve these other things, I'll be in a stronger position to <laughs> be more sustainable. <laughs> and it was just really interesting because there were, I mean, there were all manner of things on this list, but for example, one of them, you know, I've been thinking about doing a Patreon for years Mm -hmm. and I never did it. And I didn't do it because I thought, well, I'm always on the road. I don't want to commit to deliverables on a monthly schedule. Sure. I've had, it's the same reason, you know, I've had radio show opportunities. I've said no, because they want a weekly show. And I'm like, no, I don't know where I'll be. So suddenly I'm like, okay, well, there's no more touring. I'm in one place. Let me start a Patreon. And then I was, I've been working with an online festival, La Saber Fest, mm-hmm. and they gave me the, the opportunity to basically get my rig together for live streaming and force me to have to learn that really quickly, which was great. It's like, you know, it's, it started to feel like, okay, there's real possibilities here. And once I, I set up my, my rig and tweaked it a bit, but, but essentially my live rig, which I never set up at home, I set that up at home 
And I, once it was all set up, I realized, I was like, wow, I'm not going to break this down for a long time. Yeah. And the more time goes by, I'm like, I don't want to break this down for a long time. <laughs> sure. So it's it's been a relief. Let's let's talk about okay. There's a couple of things to unpack there. One is the Patreon thing because you're not just saying oh, I'm going to record a track and give it to you each month, or I'm going to you know you, you're actually using it in a in a particular way. Do you want to talk about what you're doing with your Patreon and and you know who supports you and what you provide for them? Sure. There is there are different kind of tier levels in it and. The, at the base basic level, it's what you're saying. It's like they get an exclusive new piece of music each month and then whatever else I want to throw out there. So for me, that's for the that's for people who want to support their fans. They maybe don't have the means to really support a whole lot, um, whatever it may be, and that's great. And then there's, as the tiers go up, there's a whole lot of additions where for me, it's kind of focused around building community more than anything. You know, monthly live streams and video lessons... But one thing which I've really loved already is a monthly Zoom community chat. Mm. So we did that last month, and I invited everyone to bring some music that they were inspired by or really feeling. And so everyone, you know, me and everyone else, we're all sharing music and talking about it. And, and it's, it's really, it was, a, it was actually a relief because it was at the, ti- at the peak time of the uprising in the States. You know, cities burning, cops just out of control. Well, they still are. And it, it was a really nice respite from that, actually. Right. But yeah, so the, the idea of building community with it is what really excites me. And, you know, people, the social media platforms pitch us that we're building our communities there. And the reality is, like, you know, the metrics don't make sense. Like, if I have, like, what, have, like 18,000 people on Instagram and I post a video that 200 people see, then I don't have a community there. Like, it's a total fallacy. Yeah. So Patreon can really, can build that for real. And for me, I want to make things worth people's while. You know, I, I love that. I love, I love the adage of, like, kind of under-promise and over-deliver. Yeah. You know, it's like people, I mean, we all deserve the most. So I'm, why hold back? So that, that's really become my primary focus as far as, you know, what do I want to build during this time? And I mean, there are other projects going on currently but that just feels really personal and really valuable mm. there's a, a lot of music makers on there i think the majority hence the lessons i guess yeah i mean i think that I, I wanted to build it in a way there's something for everyone kind of thing um but for the people who who want you know some some know-how knowledge i'm, I'm more than happy to share i mean you know what i think there's two there's two elements to that one is that legacy is in what we can pass on to other people. Mm -hmm. And so if I have had experience and built knowledge, which is of value to someone, then for me, there's a responsibility to pass it on. And and it's self-serving in that it creates legacy. And then there was a second thing, which just slipped my mind. (laughs) Well, okay. So there's also, of the stuff that you're doing in lockdown, there's a political dimension to that as well. Uh, And some of it came through and, and, you know, your respite from the, you know, the burning cities and and out of control police. (laughs) But also the stuff that you're doing with the festival has a very political kind of voice and message to it as well. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that a bit? Yeah. It's a, this is a really pivotal point in American history. You know, it's a potential turning point. And not just for America, but for the world. You know, as much as America's laughed at now, I think it's still a cultural force globally. And so what's happening here is really, you know, in the best sense of the word, really radical and there's so much need for change. And so I, I subscribe to that and support it 100%. While that's all happening, there's so much of information of value in media and on the feeds, which I think needs to be shared. And so that's important to me too. And so I think as an artist where we've just spent however long we've, had, we've had social media dominating for, we spent a decade plus being conditioned to work out how to promote what we do and how to present and how to shine the spotlight on ourselves. And some people do that really well, some people whatever, And it's, but that's what, that's what the conditioning has been. Mm. And suddenly you have a moment where these platforms are showing a real value in social currency as far as, you know, spread, share, disseminating news, movements, and, you know, really helping, you know, TikTok is helping push the, pushing the dial of political 
you know, outcomes. It's crazy. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And so in context of all that, it's like you have all these mu- independent music makers around the world who have been used to like, you know, putting their face forward, their music forward. It's like, well, how do you, how do you do that at a time like this? And so for me, like the last few years, I've been working on this, my project Heritage, which has been really digging into my Japanese roots through my music. And there's been a lot of cultural connectivity through that. And also recognition of the last decade that everything I do in music is informed by black American music. And if it's, if it's not black American music, then it's African diaspora music. No question. There's, there's no question about that. And so I am very aware that my voice is, you know, stands on the shoulders of giants. And I, I recognize that and acknowledge that. And so all these things, like, well, how can I, how can I just hear my own voice in this, this, in this current social moment? And so La Sabre Fest, who I'm working with, we talked about doing this like a support in support of Black Lives Matter and social justice set. And so to me, it's that's really about, you know, showing, well, like, like I said, sh- showing solidarity and being able to reframe some of these things. Like, you know, I took a couple of James Baldwin video clips and his words are amazing. And what he says doesn't need it doesn't need anything done to it. It's already you know, relevant and perfect and powerful. But to be able to take a couple of clips of him and you know, kind of run his, run his voice through some effects and kind of live score it with some solo piano. And this, for me, there was an emotional connection which really shows me my own personal relationship to what's happening now and how I, how I process it. Mm. So that particular set, the Sawabona set, it was really emotional for me. I mean... I caught moments where, like the way I have my streaming set up, I'm not really facing camera much. And I caught moments where I was, you know, I could feel tears welling up. Mm. You know, taking really powerful speeches and like Tamika Mallory, uh, it's a really powerful activist speaking in, in, in Minnesota. And taking her speech and then underpinning it and just the way, it's like when I interface with something like that, the, you know, I can't be what that is the james baldwin or tamika mallory that exists on its own but i can be me and exist and when i interface with it it's that space between these two things where i find my voice and also understanding Hmm. does that make sense absolutely and and actually when you hear the story from the beginning of this kid who's learning to play piano and going to school and kind of not knowing where he is, there, there's a sort of thread that seems to connect everything, which is about identity and, and expression of identity and connecting that with, you know, what am I trying to say and what's my voice, which I think is really interesting. I, I, you know, and I've known you for a long time. I've never actually kind of connected that to, together before. I only just connected it recently. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's so, it's so empowering because without that, it's kind of a question of like, well, what am I doing this for? I'm doing it to make money, I'm doing it to pay the rent or or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But to really understand like, you know, inner purpose is, has been invaluable to me. And also through the shutdown and doing these projects, it's birthed so many, you know, new things and new possibilities and ideas and understandings. I think that trying to, you know, trying to compete in the, you know, the, the capitalist music industry structure I don't think there's many ways to do that. Like to try and do it on your own terms and to try and come with a different kind of creative paradigm or musical expression, you know, it's not really, it's not the place for it. Mm. And so this has also been about understanding, you know, the place for what I want to do and that what I may have had in my say late twenties, which was more kind of ego based of, you know, Oh, I want this tune to blow up and I, I need that DJ to play it and all that, whatever it might be. Uh, that's just not so relevant now. What do you see in another 20 years? <laughs> I definitely won't have another 20 years of nonstop touring under my belt. You know? <laughs> well, touring doesn't happen anymore. You know that. Exactly, right? Yeah. I love the idea of being able to create at my own pace and to be a create what I want. For me, Sakamoto is a pretty amazing example of that. To you know, he exists ostensibly in his own paradigm, and he's always creating. And 
seems it, it seems that quality of life is part of the essence of his creativity. So that kind of thing is really inspiring to me for sure. But yeah, to not be worried about any kind of financial restraint and to be able to create and contribute, you know, find just for, if I can continue to evolve understanding how to make my voice a positive contribution on a societal level, that would be amazing. Right. Like it's And it's also great. Sometimes you can also dance to it. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that, that's also the fun thing of like, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm just happy for it to be, you know, some, you know, late post Coltrane free jazz avant-garde shit as I am for it to be some Dilla head nod hip hop or some bang house or whatever it might be. Mm. It's, you know, these are all timbres and, and colors in the palette, which just makes so much sense. One last thing, I guess, is that something that seems to have kind of followed through and been consistent as part of the narrative is you work with other people and you work with like really good other people and tennis. (laughs) Tell me, tell me, I I know the analogy. Tell me. Well, you know, with a tennis, it's like, you got to find a tennis partner who's better than you or you're not going to improve. Right. Right. Uh, I I, I love that analogy, but I I actually, I cut off your question too. Well, I guess that that was the question is, is the way that you make music in dialogue with other people. I, I mean, I have, especially with, you know, with lockdown, I've really focused on it. I've, I have definitely developed a solo kind of one man band thing, but the dialogue of playing with other people and having that communication is one of my favorite things in the world. Like that I've done countless gigs where I meet amazing musicians for the first time by having them jump on my stage. And, you know, before we say hi to each other, we're saying hi through notes and, melodies and rhythms and that's the magic for me you know i think you know i'm a, I'm a total advocate that collaboration makes creativity stronger and yeah it's 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 totally necessary and, I, and if i look back on the people who i've been really fortunate to collaborate with and you know become friends with many of them it's kind of like my dream like literally like my dream list of collaborators and people I grew up listening to on records and it's really special so if nothing else that just shows me that there is value to what I do and what I have to offer and that I know collaborating with people that good it can only get better Mm, interesting I guess to finish imagine there's somebody who's just listened to this interview and thought okay I don't know this guy's music at all (laughs) but he's that sounds really interesting Give me one thing they should check out by you. One thing they should check out by someone else. Wow, cool. I love it. I love it. The one thing by me is really difficult because I feel feel quite eclectic. And if I know where someone's coming from, I can kind of reference something. Like, Like if I think someone's more into like a jazz, chill vibe, I would probably say to check out Heritage, the Japanese jazz project from last year. If they're kind of more eclectic and to kind of beats and soulful club music, I would say check out Tides Are Rising, um, album I did in 2007. But I, but I feel like, you know, it's all, it's kind of gateway drug stuff. It's like once you jump in, you can have a, you know, have a search around. And for me, the, the, the entire story has been about this kind of spectrum where jazz is at one end and electronic music is at the other. Is at the other and I just keep sliding around the spectrum to different degrees. Mm-hmm. So... Short, short answer is you can't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, no, okay, I'm with you. Um, and someone else? As for someone else, uh, wow, that's a really interesting question. I would never have considered that. And introducing someone who's curious about my music to basically recommend them a record which has a relevance, you're saying, basically, right? I'm just asking the question. You interpret it however you want. Oh, my goodness. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say, I would say that one of them would be New Eurekan Soul, Masters at Work record from the late 90s. And the Black Gold of the Sun. Yep. And another would be, I know you asked for one, um, (laughs) another would be uh, Amar Jamal, The Awakening. Wow. Which is a acoustic piano jazz trio record from the late 60s. It's a great record. And lucky number three would be... Maybe 
oh, I don't know, actually. But yeah, that's a start. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, that's good. You, you interpreted it numerically. That's uh, yeah, interesting. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could feel like I could talk to you for hours. We don't do this often enough. It's uh, really good. Thanks so much for being on it. No, totally, man. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. That's Mark DeClive Lowe, and that's the MTF podcast. You can find Mark at mdcl.tv online, where you can sign up to his Patreon, whether you're after masterclasses, live stream performances, community chats, or new recordings. The show was edited by Sergio Castillo, the music's by Airtone and Keston Wright. The MTF Sonic logo is by Run Dreamer. I'm Andrew Dubber. You can find me at Dubber on Twitter. Music Tech Fest is at Music Tech Fest pretty much everywhere. The MTF podcasts out every Friday. So hit the subscribe button wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And don't forget to share, like, rate, and review because it really helps other people to find this. You have a great week. Stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Cheers. Cheers.